I'm Master Chabalikalake. Welcome to the Amma Rights, a human rights special broadcast. Do you remember who said these words? Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land shall experience oppression of one by another. <laughs> yes, it was Nelson Mandela when he signed into law our new constitution back in 1996. And his promise was about a better life. It was about dignity, about everyone getting a fair chance in life. It was about human rights. But what are human rights, though? Well, in this show, we're going to break them down in three slightly unusual ways. First, we'll talk about food and the basics we need to survive. And then we'll talk about love and sexuality, something which often defines who we are. And finally, we're going to talk about our right to be treated equally, irrespective of where we were born, whether our parents were black or white, South African, Nigerian, or rich or poor. But more about that a bit later. My guests are a diverse and amazing group of people, some very familiar faces from the world of music and entertainment, right along with community leaders and residents from across this wonderful country. So we have DJ Spoo. Joey Razdin. <laughs> Tandi Swamazwai. <laughs> Kelly Kumalo. <laughs> and Banyana Banyana striker Posha Mudise. <laughs> and last but not least, the Deputy Minister of Justice, John Jeffries. <laughs> for you at home, the hashtag for this conversation is Amaraita. And later, we might just get a song or two out of our special guests here. But don't worry, Mr. Minister, I'm not going to ask you to sing. <laughs> but let's start with a little test for my guests and for everyone at home. What actually is the Constitution? But first, we asked a bunch of people in the streets. Watch this. Yo, yo, yo. This is a difficult one. I don't know that. Uh, I don't understand the thing Constitution. C'est le règle qui régit, qui conduit le peuple pour une perfection. Of jy nou wit is, of jy swart is, of jy blauw is, amal het jy even veel rechte. Can anyone tell me what my rights are? What are your rights? Mo? My first and foremost right that I enjoy the most and I like the most is that I've got the freedom of speech. As a stand-up comedian in this country, it's a very important thing to be able to speak your mind freely without right. getting the signal jammed and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No jamming of signals yeah. here. Kelly? Yeah. I believe uh, is to have a right to be me without having to hold back, without being afraid of what society thinks of me as a person. So I have a right to be myself. Joey? I have the right to join any organization I want. Mm. So if there's a ISIS was here, I have the right to join that. <laughs> <laughs> I have the right to join any organization I want and to believe in anything uh, religiously, basically. Tandi, yeah. well? I have the right to move without being afraid that somebody will violate me. Mm. Now in South Africa, as many as a quarter of children go to bed hungry at night and millions of people lack decent homes despite the fact that the Constitution promises us access to food and water and shelter and all the basics that we need to live. In other words, many of us don't have socioeconomic rights. I mean, the last time I checked, there was no shortage of food in our supermarkets. So what is really going on? We visited some of the poorest South Africans, first uh, township youth and then farm workers, and the farm workers had been fired after going on strike for better wages. So take a look at this. Over 40% of township youth are unemployed. For them, socio-economic rights can mean the difference between a life of hardship and a brighter future. What do they know about their rights? Human rights. Human rights. Human rights. Firstly, freedom of expression. I have a right to, for education. Farm workers are some of the most vulnerable South Africans because many of them depend on their employer for all their rights, from their livelihood to their homes. If they come into conflict with the farmer, they stand to lose 
everything. Kijk, ons, als op die boer so groen, nou maar die huis behoort, die huis behoort aan ons, dat moet aan ons behoort, dat is ons recht. What's going to happen in 10 years time when you have a whole village of people on your farm and nobody's working for you? Who's going to maintain the houses? Who's going to give them basic services? As plaatwerkers opstaan voor alle rechten en hulle wil praat oor alle rechten, daar wordt hulle plat gedrukt. All right, well, DJ Spu, you're a businessman. So let's imagine that you own a farm. What would you be farming? <laughs> I don't got farm chicken. Chicken? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you why. So you're a chicken farmer. Would you allow farm workers to live on your land even when they're no longer working for you? I mean, of course, living on your land means that they'll be raising their children, they're entitled to allow their uh, broke cousins and their desperate mother-in-laws to come live with them, uh, and even their own descendants. It's their home. They can do with it what they want. Would you allow that? It's quite an interesting tone that you're using when you're saying um, broke cousins and desperate um, relatives and so forth. But I just feel, in the first place, they were working for me, so why are they not working for me anymore? So that's the issue first. But if anybody is going to work for me and I'm a farmer, obviously I have to provide them with some sort of accommodation. Kelly, what would you farm if you were a farmer? <laughs> it would probably be mealies. I love mealies. Would you allow farm workers who are no longer working on your farm? Let's take into consideration that you could be dealing with 200 farm workers who have retired. Um, that's the thing. We need to look at uh, the, the, the contract that we had before they started working with me. Does the contract state that I have to allow them to live in my land even when they're no longer working for me? So there has to be some sort of understanding. I think we have to go back to why don't they have the land in the first place? Who took their land? <laughs> <laughs> When I, was, when I was watching the video, I saw a gentle brother, Caucasian guy there, was talking about um, if, if they don't work, um, who's going to provide them with services and stuff like that. The government is there to provide our people with services, not in, in his place to do so, right? Mm. But at the same time, I honestly do believe that people go on strikes, um, especially in the rural areas, simply because of what they're earning. Well, Joey, you used to be a banker. Apparently. <laughs> I'm not sure how you went from finance to comedy, but that's a whole other story for and another firstly, day. Firstly, I'd farm what the land allows me to farm. Secondly, you have to have em empathy. So I think what people don't understand is empathy goes a long way. But you're, you're a money man. What happens when you run out of money? Uh, and again, your workers all want a wage increase, all uh, 200 uh, of them. Again, you have to understand where they come from. If you have their buy-in, then we can all grow this farm together. But it has to come from both sides, and it has to have that um, empathy viewpoint. Okay. No. All right. so, Mr. Minister, if I'm a farmer and my contract allows me to kick off any farm worker that's no longer working for me, do I have the right to do that? If their services are terminated, you would be able to, to ask them to leave. The complicating factor with most or many South African farms, uh, they've been there, some of them, for generations. So they preceded the farmer who they're now working for. And they would have then developed rights uh, as well uh, to the, the, the section that they're living on. Also, what do our audience members think? When we talk of land, I become emotional because I grew up where our fathers were taken away in the Mpumalanga Bwomplas area. But the people, the original people have not yet settled. So the slow pace of land reform, we don't have to blame the colonial system. We have to blame ourselves and the new government, the people we elected in government, that you should do one, two, and three. Who is the government, by the way? We are the government. Thank you very much. Now, Marike, I know that you've dabbled as a farm worker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What are your thoughts on this issue? It's painful. I had to work on the farm. You know, we had to work on the farm for pocket money for school. And the most important thing is, as true South African, we are so proud of our 
our so-called status, whatever it is, that we forget at the end of the day, because Mina, as Umlungo Melana, you can look at me and say, okay, u famous, which means she's got everything. Not knowing Gutim Champing Shala in a back room somewhere. But because of Estata Sami, now you're already judging me. Mm. Get to know me for who I am. Help me build my future. Mm. And let's rather do that instead of trying to poke fingers. Mm. Thank you. Very valid. Very valid point there, Mariki. Sure. I'm actually ah, going to ask this. Mm. Like, why is it surprising Ugutu Mariku was cool, Mrs. Zulu? Why is it that we don't have more white people who speak our African languages? Mm. <laughs> Minister, can you speak any language? Umangi Zamu Kukulu, Mrs. Zulu. Tata, Minister, Tata. About you by a slaker. I know, no, you deserve a 10 out of 10 for effort, Minister. <laughs> Tandi, so you're very passionate about these issues, and uh, we can talk about language, which is pivotal to preserving culture, but yeah. what is the point when we don't even have our land? Uh, land, I think, is central to, to, to black freedom. You cannot talk about our freedom if you don't speak about land because the land represents our history, it represents our culture, it represents our language, and without the land, we cannot sustain ourselves as black people. You know, not just uh, to live and to eat, but our very soul depends on us having a home to go to, classes of Kela, we have to have land in order to express ourselves freely and to be as black as we want. Ooh. You're watching the Amaraitza special. When we return, we talk sex and sexuality. And we kick off with a musical treat from one of our guests. Don't go away. Kumalo singing a very hauntingly beautiful song. Tell us about that song, Kelly. The song is about a woman who's accused of killing her husband. A woman who was denied her right to even mourn her husband, a right to justice as well. So in the middle of accusations and all and all that, she kept saying Asinne, Asinne, which is written in Chivenda. Mm, that's beautiful. And the fact that you've got a right to sing in Chivenda is also even more beautiful. I mean, yes. <laughs> And this is Amaraita. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is Amaraita. And this is a very special discussion on human rights in South Africa. And it's time to talk about the right to love. Mm. Love should be the most beautiful personal experience between two people. But for thousands of South Africans, the choice about who they love or how they express their love can lead to discrimination and even violence. Take a look at this. South Africa's Bill of Rights is the first in Africa to outlaw discrimination based on sexual orientation. And yet, many lesbian and gay South Africans are being victimized because of their sexual orientation. <laughs> So if we are not supposed to be allowed to sing, then we are not What about yeah. the rights? There are no rights. No rights. No what rights? Right. What are you talking about? My kumama right. rights. There are no rights to sing. Panero nduba na budi pinduleiri. Uchi kuchira fano South Africa. As you are sorry, una panero. Ufano kandere zaza muwa. So is anyone here still living in the closet? Joey. Huh? Aisha, why don't you 
that could be an outing, wouldn't well, it? I was about to say, of course, if you were, you're not going to expose yourself on national uh, television, right? Not really, yeah. But if, if you are a bi guy, if you're a gay guy, you must be proud of it. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's say you're gay. Uh, let's say, well, you don't know. Are you? <laughs> of course, it would be uh, your right I, to disclose or not to disclose, but let's yeah, say you it would are be. Gay. It would be. It would be. But I'm right. in love with somebody. And, a, and a woman. I yes, a woman, yeah. Okay. And, and, and I hope she watched this program. So. <laughs> <laughs> but she's been outed now. Uh, she's not. No, no, let's not go into this. <laughs> but you know what? You know what? You know what? So, and and, and Toles may also know. Yeah, but it's for sure. If you want to be with a guy and you're and you a guy, it's most lekker. Would you yeah. be able to tell your mother? Yeah, it's lekker. It's, that's our on steel swap. Okay, no. I'm Coming from the, the home that you come from, yeah. Would you be able to be open about that with your mom? Um, you know, I have family, I think, that um, play for the other teams. So it's like... Uh, but it's interesting, you haven't answered my question. Yes. Would you tell your mom yeah. if you were gay? I don't know. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Even in South Africa, hmm. the country where... I mean, we were, what, we were the fifth country in the world to legalize gay marriage. There are still people who aren't free enough to, to be open about their sexuality. In fact, there are people who've been discriminated for being gay or for being lesbian. Portia, now you've, you're open. Mm. You've lived your life openly. Do you feel that you can express your affection to the woman or women in your life openly, freely, without getting funny looks from people? I might give funny looks. You might give funny yeah. looks. When I watch the, uh, there was a guy talking to Adam no F or no Eve or no one. If they want to sit no Adam no Eve, Baba Chela, would you be really wrong? Please, I will change myself. But if Baba has a battle on Kulunkul, I'm not going to pipe Lily Polo, Joseph, or Fis or Tem. I feel good I don't do any harm to anyone, you know, to live my life. And I'm, I'm really helping other people out there. So I'm 100% percent good to uncle 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 So I'm, I'm being me. We love that about yeah. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Minister, you're gay. No. Imagine you were gay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine you work it. Mm -hmm. Would you be open enough to tell your doctor, Look, the people you work with? Yeah, I think it's very difficult. The, uh, the right not to be discriminated against on the basis of your sexual orientation is in the equality clause in the Constitution. Uh, the difficulty is just the attitudes of society, the, the response from people, um, from family, from people at work, from society as a whole makes it more difficult. And let's talk about that discrimination. Has anyone here ever been discriminated against on the basis of your sexuality? Yes. You have? But I'm openly gay. And you know, I went to um, a, a government clinic to consult. And my partner was there with me. So when I told the nurse, when I disclosed, because I had to disclose so that I can get proper treatment. Because if I wasn't going to tell her that I actually engage in anal sex or whatever, the nurse wouldn't have been able to know what treatment to give me. So next thing I know, the nurse goes out, then she brings another nurse. Hmm. Then another nurse comes in. <laughs> then another nurse comes in. So they come and just, oh, I, I came to get something from this room. So later on I realized that, okay, maybe she went on and told everyone on the corridors that there's a gay man. He, he engages in anal sex because when you are gay, people only frown about the kind of sex that you have. What I do in bed has nothing to, to do with anyone because even heterosexuals can do what I do in bed. So it's not even about that. It's about me as a person. Respect me so that I can respect your rights as well. That's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Um, it would be difficult for a, a, a South African male to say that they are homophobic because yeah. these people are everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know what friends. I'm saying? And they're your friends. Yeah, they're your and friends. I, 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 yeah, you know what? And I've got everywhere. an 11 year old son. TK is exposed to Auntie Solly, Auntie Linda, mm -hmm. Auntie. Anti to me, the anti, doll domination. The whole doll domination crew, you know them. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And it's not your choice as a parent to decide yeah. if they're going to be straight or they're going to choose to yeah. do their own thing. Very true. That's wonderful. Unfortunately, religion has played a huge role in creating a larger space between those who choose to be 
to live an alternative life and those who are deemed to be normal. The, the most interesting thing with the, with, with the Christians is that they always quote the Bible when they have run out of weight on arguing whether homosexuality is African or not African. They have a lesbian, a gay, they have a girl, they have a girl, they have a no mabaya pila bantuana si hamba nabo ngoba si tiba bantuana batuale umfane giso kankulunkul si awatanda banga bantuana betu si kabo zali ba se whiteville na se davidon si zesa figa na se fentes dob si opega lumtuana owa bulawela ubuli spini ake wa fagi was pipe ba zali kuba ni kona ni atandaza anuko hasu kutandaza ni begele abantuana be nuni ba zele ngapande. So we've been talking about freedom of sexuality, but what about the freedom of choice where sexual activity is concerned? Now this has been in the news. The Justice Ministry are planning to ensure that young people under the age of 16 are not persecuted for having sex. Some people are worried that this might encourage them to have sex. What do you think? Do you know what freaks me out a lot, Mas Chaba, is that my son turns 12 this year in December and I have to talk to him about sex. So you haven't started it. I haven't, my man, my man. Do you know what? Let me tell you, Spuda. Let me explain to you now. My son goes to a Christian school. So somehow I also have to respect the values of the school. What is this thing about sexuality though? Because it's something we're all born with. Yeah. And you must educate your child so that when they make that decision, they at least do things that are safe for, for them to be able to and interact. They've got the knowledge. They've yeah. got the knowledge, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. My daughter is 15, I started yeah. talking to her in grade point. one. Yeah. In grade yeah. one. Yeah. Seven years old. So you started because that she's starting to ask me, sure. Uguti, eh, Mama, lo uso, lo uso. how did you have a baby? Yeah. These questions get asked, right? Mm. Obviously, mm. you don't tell a child, everything, you mm. check where they are. Yes. And that's the thing is you have to know your child. Yeah. The truth of the matter is sex is who we are. It's, yeah. a, it's part of who we are. And we all make a decision to do it at some point I'm, or another. Just, but I'm on, that note, on yeah. that note, because after what Tandiso has said, which is a very valid point, mm. should we be criminalizing them if they decide to engage in sex uh, at the age of 14 or 15? Oh should they go God. to jail? That does not help anything. No, we are... We forget ourselves at times and we do things in front of our children that push our children to end up doing things like that. So if we as parents cannot set the example that we are supposed to set, if me as a mother brings in every second night another man into the house, my child will think it is normal. And fathers, what are you doing to change your son's mind? Because we are acting things, we are doing things in front of Banabaruna and our kids end up saying, Mama, li, Papa, they do this so I can do this. I've got a son. My son is 13. He's extremely handsome. Girls love him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm, not even, I'm not even showboating or anything. I'm not even, I'm not even being arrogant. Kelly and him will tell you. So it's very, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for him or your child to be naughty if he's with you all the time. But your child is not with you all the time. Yeah, but you must know, where is he? If he's at school, he's at school. If he's with his friend, he's at, with his friend. There's no way that you as a parent won't know. Like, I know for a fact my child is now with my brother. If he's making nonsense, my brother's going to move him. That's the thing. <laughs> Why does the ministry want to decriminalize underage sex? Look, uh, currently in terms of the Sexual Offences Act, uh, sex under, for kids under 16 is illegal. Uh, the issue, as I think has been raised by the audience, is that parents need to, parents, guardians, teachers, whoever, need to look after their kids. You can't expect the state to stop your kids having sex by criminalizing it. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, after the break, we ask, who's a South African? Who is a foreigner? Who is human enough to be entitled to human rights? Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back. This is the Amaraita Human Rights Special Broadcast with me, Masa Chabale Kalake. We are 20 years into democracy and black on black violence is on the rise. In the first part of 2015, more than 400 shops were looted in Soweto and other townships. 
almost 1,500 people were driven from their homes. Most were Somali or Ethiopian. Now, we're gonna talk about rights and wrongs of that situation. But first, some background. Watch this. South Africa is now a diverse society with over two million people from the African continent and other parts of the world settled here. Despite the protection of their rights in the constitution, many of them experience prejudice. What rights do they have? They could have the same rights as us because overall they are human beings. They are not animals. Simple as that. Uh, I'd say no, because those rights are structured for South Africans in South Africa. Here in Yeovil, where certain people are taking, for example, their advantage of their citizenship to undermine the foreigners. Kelly Kumal. So let's imagine your father owns property and he has um, a vacant space for a shop. He could have the option of hiring it out to a local, or, but there are two other Somali citizens who want to rent that space. So he decides he wants to go local. What do you say to him? I'd have a problem because first and foremost, I believe we are all equal. God designed us, all of us in his image, whether you're from Uganda or wherever. If it was up to me, we would not even have border gates and whatnot. Right. Even. And here's something that I've always battled with. I mean, why is it that, I mean, there's a term for, apparently white people are called tourists. Yeah. yeah. And expats. Mm. While black people came up with a query. What is your view on this? People say that they are refugees. Which country in Africa is in war? You know, because I don't know, Zimbabwe is not in war. People in Zimbabwe, they should be helping uh, Robert Mugabe to restructure the land program. But it cannot be that when we have the scarce skills or scarce resources, we welcome the blind, we welcome the crippled, we welcome the old. So what do you say? Blind, we've never seen blind our old. and crippled no, no, foreign no, no, no. nationals should not be welcome. In Zimbabwe, when we are old, kukile, kukile, when we are crippled, there's no benefit. What were people doing when they were attaining liberation 50 years in Ghana, 1957? People messed up their own resources they come here to claim things that they cannot access in their own countries. Yeah. Yes, people might come, but they must contribute. Not hang in the street, ask us money. Today we sit. Where do Nigerians work? Because I don't see them at Pick and Pay. I don't see them at MTN. Oh, I don't Lord. see them at Woolworths. Oh, Where do they work? Stop no, no, no. Can I say this? Can I continue? So, gentlemen, you're from the African Diaspora Forum. How do you respond to what Ike has just said? Yes. Actually, as an African, I'm very disappointed. Other Africans supported uh, South, uh, South African dignity apartheid is not well taught to them. Because remember, Zambia was very, very poor when Zambians accommodated South African. They even give them some space to be trained as MK. And that is story, my brother is not, uh, is not taught about that. No, that is true. I was born one, in Zambia. Uh, I'd just like to find out how you define who's, um, who's an immigrant. Because my ancestors came here in 1860. Does this make, mean that I'm not entitled to be here? Uh, you know, South Africa's uh, population is a largely immigrant uh, population. And uh, I, th this is the thing uh, about the, the recent events, the uh, recent xenophobic events, is that we discriminate about people who've come here recently. When the, the, the history of this country showed that white people, Indian people have all come from other places. We've settled here, we've helped to build the country. And the people who've come here now are looking to do the same thing. So who are we to say, oh, you can't come here now because I have more entitlement to, uh, than somebody else? I'm half Nigerian, half South African. And, and the thing is that so many of these immigrants coming into South Africa have degrees and things like that. And, and the thing is, they don't use them, like, because some of the times they can't get jobs with these degrees they have. And the other thing I want to say is, have you walked around Nigeria and Ghana recently? There are Spurs and Edgars and so many of the stores we see here, okay. and they do not get looted, they do not get killed for just existing. That's a very good point. <laughs> I was working, I was working in a farm. The farm owner, we are doing the export for the oranges. The farm owner was employing us from Eastern Cape. The money was good. Now Zimbabweans came in that company. The money dropped out. And now we are chasing all of the black people, like Trossas and Sutus, out of that farm. And now it's only Zimbabweans. But surely it is not the Zimbabweans' fault when the government is not regulating. It's, it's right? a cheap labor. The problem is the cheap labor. I'm, I'm very sad, in fact, with some comments I'm hearing from some of my black brothers here makes me sour in my heart. I'm from Nigeria, and I'm an economic migrant. I came here with dollars to invest here. Mm. And coming down here, we employ people. 
We give them life. We support them. I'm married to South Africa. All my kids are South Africa. So whether you like it or not, Mr. Man, we are here to stay. And one thing I want to tell you, what, what, what I want to tell you, what I want to tell you, my own brother is one of the, in fact, the only professor of gynecology in South Africa that is a black man, Professor Bangui. So I want to say today that these people, they need to change their psyche. But, but obviously it's not just the people that need to change their psyche. What about the government? Look. Uh, it is true that the borders of South Africa uh, are fairly artificial. Uh, they were determined in London or in Berlin. Uh, people moved around. So with Zimbabweans, a lot of people from what is now South Africa moved into Zimbabwe, uh, the Ndebele under Mzilikazi in, in about the 1830s. Why it isn't really xenophobia but more Afrophobia mm -hmm. is it's an issue of the opportuni economic opportunities. And so where people from South Africa feel that people from other countries on the continent are competing with them for resources, that's when there's, there's tension. The problem is, is basically yeah. issues of, of unemployment and poverty. One, one point while I'm still on the floor that I think is quite important to note is that with the, the Bill of Rights, it generally refers, applies to people. Um, there are very few sections where it applies to citizens. I think it's mainly the right to vote. Mm. All people are entitled to basic human rights, mm. whether you're Zimbabwean, whether you're Nigerian, uh, mm. whether you're from Congo. I feel that South Africa is one of the, the, the countries that has the most uh, flexible laws as far as um, accommodating other African brothers and sisters is concerned. And I feel the media perpetuates or spreads um, this tone of language that we have, we are xenophobic, and actually, but the majority of South Africans are not xenophobic. Mm -hmm. you know, Let's when, move 440 when it comes to, shots when it, when it comes to exactly that point, that yeah. now yeah. when when you are talking about shops being looted, it's easy for us to jump in in the media and write xenophobia, mm. and you get other people that run businesses in the township complaining. Oguti, there's other people that come and they charge lesser prices because they buy as a collective, mm. and then the, the blame goes into township business people. Oguti, as Sangani to come up with the type of solutions. And I'm saying, starting from now on, I'm gonna come up with bread, I'm gonna come up with toilet paper, I'm gonna come up with energy drinks. Probably all of us are migrants in one way or another. We mentioned we've been forced off our land, haven't we? Forced removals from cities to townships. People have come here as indentured laborers, as traders, as all kinds, as conquerors as well, as, a, as a colonialists. We're all migrants, we all move. The other point I wanted to make was, who is at fault? Who is at fault if they are employing people from outside our borders below the minimum wage? Everyone has the same right. Everyone ought to have the same wage. Who is at fault? It's the South African employer, isn't it? Not the brothers and sisters who are struggling, like we all are. It's the South African employer that's breaking a South African law. So when we return, we ask, whose job is it to sort things out so that humans in Zanzi can enjoy their human rights. You're watching Amaraita. We'll be back in a moment. And Masachabele Kalake, welcome back to Johannesburg and to our human rights show, Amaraita. So, Utata Nelson Mandela once said, to challenge someone's basic human right is to deny their very humanity. So who do we turn to when our rights are violated and our humanity is challenged? Let's hear from our audience. If we're restricting the foreigners to come this side, how are we able to do international trade with them? Because our economy is going to fall, not rise. So if we don't work together and present a united front, then we won't be able to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Today in my high school that I come from, I did my matric last year, my maths teacher is a Nigerian, but look, today I know maths. No South African, we're in shortage of teachers, you know? Today we, we know maths. Today, today I, can, I can help my siblings with maths and accounting. So what are the South Africans doing? Instead, they keep complaining. Let's work out for ourselves. I'm actually disappointed. What are we teaching kids in our country? We're saying we're praying for love. We're saying we're praying for our country to be one. How can we be one? The problem, Kabatuba South Africa, is one. advantages. That's one. We never work for ourselves. We're expecting the government to work for us. 
ndiva kaphlungu xa siphatha kakubi okanye silwa nabantu abasuka ngaphandle because sibethwa kungazi ulwazi letho ncinci ukuze eli lizwe lime utatu Mandela namaqabane akhe bancedwa kwamanyamazwe Baba Fisa, Baba Kusela, Babenzela Uguti, Gomso, Sibenelis, Sina Sesilla Malungelo, Sassinga now, La Malungelo before, but Sessina, when I'm Sanja, Gengaya, Babaye, Kwamanya Mazu, Bafisha Kwamanya Mazu, Wise Melisilis Abantu Bagut. Thank you. Um, this is Brian Sibeko. I'm an activist. Some of you might know me as a gay activist, but an activist is someone who stands up for everyone, irrespective. So I don't fight only for gay people, but I fight for everyone across. And I'm disturbed by all the comments which were made, because as gay myself, if a woman or a mother was to stand up and say something negative about gay people, she's giving someone the right to go and violate someone. By what we just said now, say, with all due respect, you've incited violence somewhere. Someone in here has the right now, because of what they've heard from you, to go out there you know, and violate these shops and kill whoever. Too little information is very dangerous. Thank you. If we could only respect each other, let's look beyond skin color. Let's look beyond I'm black, you white. Let's look beyond that. Let us respect each other from the level of just beings. Forget that I'm male. Forget that you are female. Just remember that we're all human at the end of the day. So whatever you need, I also need. So we need each other in order to achieve whatever you want to achieve. So people from outside or people who are born here or people who came here in a different way, we all need each other. This is a chain. Even in biology, we know that we feed off each other. So you can't say this, these people are not supposed to be in here because we need them in order to survive. If Mudim Agafa, Muna O Mujalo Mohetolan, or it's a Juan, cause in Tongue and Way in Alinaque, in Alacam Hoyfield and Garo, and a Jalo Santo Amorello Soling Garo, and never Trava Saka Badira, and never Twelve Roaring Kimas in Babi Rajam as in Banaka Tushor, Kabafa Tushori, Badira Sebadiras, Bato Hotori, Bato Tsmaoriji with the Fella, Dora Nakamuki, Refella, Relga, Teleta, about Lava Kushis or Batwa, Pasana Lerena. Discrimination is a very dangerous thing. You don't choose the color of your skin before being born. You don't choose the country where you're going to be born. Why did we choose Mama Zuma to be at the AU? It's because we want to be one. Do we understand that? That's what we should work towards. When we return, a final word from our guests in studio. Welcome back to Amaraita, our discussion of human rights in South Africa. If you want to continue this conversation, the hashtag is Amaraita. And you might just get an answer from the minister here or from one of our special guests or experts and follow Amaraita on Twitter as well. So let's find out what our special guests are taking away from today's discussion. Portia. Most of my time I spend it in Africa and I come back home in peace. So I would say it, it, we have to practice Oktanda Natina as South Africans. But when Alavante sit among foreigners, they love each other. That is why they could work together and come up with solutions. Probably Nati, as South Africans, we need to stop to have pride and do that and try to have friends outside our country so we could get help. Because Mina, I spend my time playing football in Nigeria, Ghana, Zimbabwe. And I always come back home being happy, having another family somewhere. And I'm always safe. Yeah, so I, I will say, last time, Ms. Kuluma, I want to be homosexual mom. Uh, I don't like Ubizwa Namakama to quote me with names, which is lesbian, when I'm Portia. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a woman loving other women. I don't want to be a man. No. I love myself. Probably I love the swag, yeah, my chance. That is why I'm going to be swag. <laughs> so so I, I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm just saying, let's try to practice the word love <clears throat> amongst us before we could want other people to preach it. Mm. Thank you very much, Portia. Thank you. Tolas Mo, 
today was hectic, eh? I just have a message to the gentle brother whose heart was broken by Nigerian girl. Eh? <laughs> Our gentle brother there wearing the red shirt. <laughs> no, I, I feel like you're in, like somebody, someone, some Nigerian girl broke that. That's why you feel this way towards our brothers. All I can say, all I can say is this: né? in South Africa, we are all black people that originate from all parts of Africa. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, in the minute we would see beggars, abantu abamnyama, would sonkele sonkele sing abantu abamnyama. You understand? Never mind over and above ukuba umuntu omnyama, sing abantu ngathi. You understand? So even if uma brother la ngabuya la buya khona ukuthi khrezela asikhrezela ngakhona, it does not make you any better or any more of a human being than he is. You understand? And yes, so many of us have got our own social standards. When you're worried about this, worried about that. It's not about that. It's about internal love, as this gentle brother said here. You know what I'm saying? Do the world a favor, my brother, and just love yourself, man. Yeah. Love yourself. Yeah. I'm talking to you. Love yourself. It's time. I'm going to say this, and I, I mean, I, th I think I've been very public about who Mariki is. Mariki was brought up by white people who took... Uh, it's into their heart to teach their children singing in 13 languages, which I do till today. But when they left me homeless, as a white girl living in one of the most dangerous areas in Gauteng, which is Drizik 4, Orange Farm, Palm Springs, Lakeside, Everton, I, I was accepted. Not because Zulu, but because And now, who are we to judge the one next to you? Do you know their past? Do you know where they come from? Mariki is going to stand to this until the day I die. Uguti, you have no right to judge me. I am who I am. I am proud of the path I walked. And I am proud of what I have become. So instead of you sitting there judging the one next to you, looking at their color, looking at their language, looking at uh, their education and what they have achieved in life, when now what are you doing? When now what did you do for yourself in life? What are you doing to change lives? This is what human rights is about. It's about you making a difference. If you try so hard to be the Kelly Kumal, to be the next um, Tole Smo, Who's going to be you? Who's going to take your t chance in life? And who's going to make a difference? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariki. <laughs> DJ Spook? Um, I, I just feel as a representative of the Susi Solop Education Foundation and the outstanding work we do in promoting education in the townships, we do believe in um, the importance of education amongst our young people. Um, but I also would like to emphasize on the point that majority of South Africans are actually not xenophobic. Um, I love my country. I really do think we're one of the most diverse countries in, in this continent. And the, the, it's evident that if you go to any township in this country, we're all living amongst ourselves. And when you come back to that issue of uh, people looting, uh, say, what, the so-called uh, foreigners' stores, people like myself are used to coming up with solutions rather than complaining. And I'll, I'll, and I'll put this challenge to the government and say, Africans need to start producing their own instead of just being consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sibu. Thank you. Mr. Joey Razdin. Uh, I believe that everybody in this entire world has been born with one thing, and that's love. It's intrinsically in everybody of us, our children, and the future. I'm a right size, actually a, a vehicle for us to show that love within, within ourselves to the other people. And that's what I've learned here today. Thank you. Well, what I've learned here today is that we all, I mean, I guess it's something you notice all the time, is that we all have different opinions about what should be happening in the world. But the one thing that we must agree upon, and the one thing that we all have to do, you don't have a, a choice in this one, is that you have got to treat other people with dignity. You have got to understand that you have to give other people their humanity. So it doesn't matter what your religion is, where you come from, how rich or poor or how white or black you are, at the end of the day, you have got to afford people their basic humanity. Thank you. And that's it. All right, Kelly Kumalo. Yes, ma'am. Yo. I'm so saddened by what I've experienced here. And uh, I mean, it, there's so much brokenness. 
I personally believe that we were created by love for love. And if we lose love, we lose ourselves, and which is what I see here today. Thank you very much. Look, I think clearly a lot more needs to be done about educating people about their rights. Uh, that needs to be done by government, but it also needs to be done by people in civil society and everybody here. Another aspect is that there are a lot of rights that we all have, um, a lot of rights in Chapter 2 of the Constitution. But in exercising those rights, we need to be mindful of the impact on other people. So it's also issues of respect for other people uh, and ensuring that the way you live your life doesn't detract from the way they're able to live theirs. Thank you. Thank you very much. We live in a very unequal country of great talents and potential, but where poverty and deprivation stalk the land. We have a long way to go to create the society we promised ourselves in the honeymoon of our democracy. Will we create a country in which every life is valued and can be lived to the full? Well, the answer lies in your hands. Thank you for watching.